All right. Well, good morning, everyone. Or should I say howdy? Well, I'm really excited to be here to talk to you today. And I'm talking to you about how to think like a scientist. Right? And this is so great because it's something you already know. It's just a scientific method. Make observations, form a hypothesis, test that hypothesis, and analyze your results. It's just that simple. You don't need a lab coat, gloves, goofy goggles, although very often I wear all these things. You just need that structured framework. And that's what we use every day across the world to answer some of the biggest questions intrinsic to who we are that help us learn and grow as a species. But that's the easy part. The challenge is thinking like a scientist when you're outside the lab. Let me give you an example. In my free time, I like to spend it in the snow. Living in Dallas, that's not always the easiest task. But nevertheless, here we are. It's my brother and a friend. We're climbing a volcano in Ecuador. Now, just hours before this, on our way to the summit, we ran into a, a pretty big question. And it's a massive crevasse, right? And what that is, it's a fissure in the ice formed by years and years of glacial movement. And these things can be up to three to four miles deep. So basically, it's a hole that if you fall into it, you're probably not coming back out. So we walk up to this. I, uh, I take a look down. And uh, you know, that's it. We tried. I'll see you guys back at base camp. But wait, let's see if we can solve this using the scientific method. So one, we make observations. Well, this hole is, is really wide. In fact, it goes the whole length of the mountain. So there's no way we can go around it. And two, I left my ladder at home. So it doesn't look like we're going to be able to walk across. But there is a spot. It's about five feet wide. And given our altitude, the wind speed, I hypothesize I can jump across. So step three, test your hypothesis. <laughs> step 3A, convince brother to test hypothesis. <laughs> and it worked. There he goes. He jumped across. And now step four, analyze data. Well, I know I can jump way farther than my brother. I'm pretty sure I can make it across, too. And that's what happened. All three of us made it safely across and continued on to the summit. But I bring up this example in a very lighthearted way, merely to illustrate that most of the questions we'll have in life will be outside the lab. And that's why it's so important. Because sometimes finding the answer to one of these questions can be the difference between life and death. I want to leave you real quick with a story about someone, about the person who inspired me to think like a scientist. And this guy's name is Logan Byrne. So earlier this year, Logan, my brother, and I decided we we're going to go out for a climb in Arizona. It's a big granite dome. It's about 1,200 feet. And uh, given, uh, given our ability and the difficulty of the climb, we knew it would take about 13 hours to get to the top. So we trained for about six months leading up to it. In the morning of, we, uh, we got there well before dawn, hiked in, and started our climb. Um, and things are going great. Um, this is about two pitches up. And uh, what a pitch is, it's a distance of the rope, right? So you're climbing just using one rope. When you go the length to get to the top, you make, a, you make a pivot point, and then you do it again. And you repeat this several times. And the challenge, though, is if there's, because it's just one rope, if there's any spot you can't finish, any spot on the whole route, you're stuck, because the only way out is up and over the top. So as we're climbing, uh, we're having a great time. But we, uh, we realize there's another group of climbers up ahead of us. Um, and this isn't uncommon, but they're going quite slow. In fact, you know, given our schedule, we realize we're not going to be able to make it, make it to the top on time if we stay behind them. So we, uh, we ended up taking an alternate route. And here we are. We, uh, we topped out just at sunset. And it's a beautiful view out, out over the valley. And uh, a fun history lesson. This was actually just two weeks before the selfie was invented. So uh, unfortunately, Logan, Logan wasn't a part of the picture. Um, but as, as beautiful as it was, um, we realized we had to get out of there really quickly. Um, because while it's nice during the day, these mountains are extremely inhospitable at night. Temperatures can drop well below freezing, and winds can get up to 70 miles an hour. Um, so we're, we're headed out. And just as we do, we hear, we hear a noise in the background. It's faint at first, and then we hear it again. When we do, my, uh, my stomach sinks, because we know exactly what just happened. 
It's the other climbers. And without headlamps, they're stranded somewhere down on the rock. And given the conditions and environment, we know it, there's no way they're going to survive the night. So I panic. And I, I reach for my pack. I pull out my sat phone. Um, and I'm trying to call in a rescue team. And we all know, given how remote the area, it's very unlikely the rescue team's going to get there in time. And that's where Logan steps in. He says, guys, we're not going to let these climbers die out here tonight. Like, OK, Logan, what are we going to do? So we, uh, my brother and I, we rig up an anchor, put Logan on a rope, and we start lowering him down. And the winds are going so fast, you, you can't hear anything. But Logan's searching frantically for the climbers below. And as he descends, he eventually finds them. Uh, the first one, the man, um, he's despondent. You know, Logan tries to talk to him, and he can't put two words together. He doesn't know where he is, and he's trying to rappel down a single strand of rope. For those of you who don't know climbing, that's, that's something you would never do. Um, and in fact, Logan actually grabs the end of the rope um, and realizes they are just two elbow links on the end. That means if we had stayed at the top, waiting for the rescue team just 30 more seconds, that man would have gone off the end and into the darkness below. So Logan quickly attaches the man to, that, to the wall, stabilizes him, and continues down, and finds the woman. And she's, she's in an even more desperate situation. She's, she's so exhausted, she can't even hold on to the rock. She's just dangling on the rope. And she's fading in and out of consciousness, and the wind is blowing her up against the wall repeatedly. And this is a very dire situation. So Logan instantly goes to what he knows. He makes observations. So he looks down, and he realizes the rope, it's attached about 10 feet below in a ret, and it's preventing her or the man from climbing up any farther. So he makes a hypothesis. He says, if I can remove that rope, we can free these climbers. We can help them pull up to the top. So he tries, right? He's testing his hypothesis. And for an hour, he tries to unwind the rope, pulls it every direction, puts all his strength into it, but it, it doesn't budge. So he analyzes his results. And he realizes the woman, as she's dangling there, her weight is countering the rope further and further into the arete. And the longer she stays there, the harder it's going to be to free it. So he goes back. He makes a new hypothesis. What if we took the woman's weight off the rope? So he tries. He tries to regain her consciousness and get her just for a second, just to grip on, to put all her strength into it, just for a couple seconds, to take her weight off. But it's no use. The woman is completely spent, and she can't. So Logan analyzes the situation again. What if, what if she wasn't attached to the rope at all? So he reaches down. She's wearing a, a climbing harness with gear. And he grabs off two cams, right? And he stops them right in the rock. And then takes her. He clips her right into it. Now she's attached completely to the face. And he unties her rope. And in less than two minutes, he's able to pull it free, freeing both the climbers. And from above, we can raise them up and over the ledge and into safety. About two hours later, as we're reviving the climbers and preparing for the long descent off the other side, the man reaches into his pack. And he pulls out two working headlamps. You know, those climbers had all the tools they needed to free the rope themselves. They had the gear, they had the skill, they had the light. But in a tough situation, they panicked. And that's why Logan, great climber that he is, he didn't save those climbers using an elite set of rescue skills. He saved them using a structured, scientific way of thinking. Now, each one of you will come across a series of questions every day, some big, some small. But almost certainly, all those questions will be outside the lab. And that's why it's so important. Because sometimes, even the smallest questions can have some really big answers. Thank you.